Yes, welcome. We will also be talking about the, the problems, uh, the software thing uh, to make a VPN, uh, encounters when trying to send your packets over the internet. And uh, the problems they it encounters is not only applicable to Think, but also to other VPN software or other peer-to-peer -peer applications. So a bit about Think. Uh, it started in September 1997, when there was a new kernel, and it came with a new device, the EtherTap device. Uh, and you now know it as the TunTap device, maybe. Uh, but then I thought, oh, that's nice. Uh, what can I do with it? And I wrote a little program that captured the packets from this virtual network device that the EtherTap device created. And you could send it via Netcat or SSH to another computer, and there you could do the reverse. So you could send up a VPN. But uh, it grew and grew, and currently it's a mature daemon that has a number of features. For example, that it connects multiple sites together, and not just two endpoints, but uh, any. It routes packets, or it can switch them, so it can work like a, an Ethernet uh, device or a, a router. It fully supports IPv6, both on the VPN, but also when uh, tunneling packets over the internet. Uh, it has no central server. It does not make a distinction between clients and servers. And the idea is that you configure some endpoints um, in the VPN, and then Tink will fill in the rest and will create a full mesh network. And I will explain that later. Uh, behind the screens, it works uh, this way, very simply put. Uh, the daemons connect via TCP. They exchange data. in the kernel. Then there was Vitan, which started at the same time as Tink. But these projects are, uh, to my knowledge, uh, dead now. But you all know IPsec and OpenVPN, I think. Um, and another one uh, is Hamachi. It's a closed source, uh, commercial-like. Uh, it's kind of a Skype for VPN, uh, which is peer-to-peer uh, -peer and shares uh, many of the features of Tink. But lesser known, but uh, other projects, all open source projects. Uh, here are the GNU Virtual Private Ethernet, which was started as a fork of Tink. It's cloud VPN, social VPN, end to end. And last year there was a presentation here uh, about virtual distributed Ethernet, which deals with uh, connecting virtual machines together, but actually it shares most of the features of uh, VPN. So, uh, what do you want to do with Tink? Now, we have the internet here, it's the blue cloud, and we have some nodes. These are the black circles. Now, a node can be a single laptop, uh, for example, at a hotel or an airport, or it can be a complete uh, network from a company. Uh, and we all want to connect these nodes together into a single VPN. Now, uh, what you have to do, each node has to supply some configuration to think, so that uh, each node can make a connection to another node uh, so that they are all part of the v VPN. But uh, it doesn't matter in which way you connect nodes. The topology uh, is up to you. But then, Tink will exchange information between nodes about where everybody is, and Tink will create direct connections from each uh, node to every other node. Uh, but it uses connectionless UDP for this. Uh, this is efficient, and it uh, scales well, even if you have 100 uh, or more uh, nodes. But the reality on the internet is not so nice. Um, I've uh, drawn a few red lines here, these red, um, uh, red arcs here, for example, are uh, network address tra translators, which are very common these days. Uh, and the problem with those is you can make outgoing connections, but incoming connections fail. Um, and uh, another problem is that some ISPs uh, tend to block certain kinds of traffic. For example, they can block UDP or only allow port 80 communications. And that's the red line here. Now you see that most of the lines, the solid lines from the previous slide, have disappeared. Um, 
And some nodes, uh, for example, behind uh, net device cannot connect directly with each other anymore. They can still go via another path. But more uh, yeah, problematic is that if a node connects to another node behind a net, and that's the initial connection it makes, then it does not receive information about where the rest is. So it is completely disconnected from the VPN. Now I will describe uh, most of the, these problems in some more detail. Uh, the problem of net is that the source address and port change, um, and uh, incoming connections are blocked, uh, even if you make an outgoing connection to the same uh, to, the, to the other side, because they don't know what the new port is. There are a few solutions. You can route via a third node, but that's inefficient, of course. Uh, you can do port forwarding, but the user has to set up it on his net device. And it's manual work, and maybe your net device does not support it, or you cannot, uh, you're not the administrator of that device. There is a protocol called UPnP, which you, allows you to discover net devices on your network. You can find out which ports they map your connections to, and even open up connections. Uh, and there is this uh, protocol called uh, Session Traversal Univers Utilities for Net, uh, or Internet Connectivity Establishment which are uh, IETF protocols, which uh, allow you to puncture uh, holes through, net, uh, through a net. And uh, in some cases, it can allow you to establish direct connections. But this is a complex protocol. And it's also not always possible. Some net devices just do not allow any form of direct communication. Uh, to put it in pictures, we have two uh, nodes uh, behind the net device. And they want to make a direct connection. But the outgoing connection works, but here ends up uh, being blocked by the net. The other one tries to connect back, and it also fails. But they can exchange information via a third node. Now, the idea is that the third node uh, knows, because it can see the port and address that the net device maps the internal connections to, uh, which port and address the other node should use when connecting to the first node. So if both nodes know this information, they can adjust their connection to use the right port to go through the net device. Another problem that uh, we encountered is that uh, packets are fragmented uh, on uh, VPNs, because if a packet on your VPN is already the maximum uh, size of, that your network allows, and then you encapsulate it in a new packet, then this will be larger than the or, uh, original packet, and it will be fragmented by your operating system. Now, this is uh, a bit bad for performance, uh, but uh, more importantly, some uh, ISPs or firewalls block fragments. And so this would uh, block uh, most of your VPN uh, traffic. Now, the solution that we implemented is to determine the path uh, maximum transfer units between nodes. And then, when one node wants uh, to send a packet to another node, and it has to fragment it, Instead, the Tink daemon will generate an ICMP fragmentation needed packet, which tells the original sender, hey, your packet is too large, you have to make it smaller. And uh, this is an uh, IP level uh, mechanism, so this should in principle work for all IPv4 and IPv6 traffic. And for other kinds of traffic, which uh, Tink can also support, it will fall back to TCP encapsulation. But the problem is that there's also some firewalls and ISPs that block ICMP packets. Because 10 years ago, you could still crash computers by sending a large ping packet. Uh, so they decided, oh, block all ICMP. But uh, yeah, the problem is then that uh, when Tink generates ICMP packets, and they somehow leave the VPN and go to the internet, this can happen if you have your default gateway on the VPN and have road warriors connect to that via the VPN. Then uh, a host on the internet tries to send packets to the VPN, but these packets are too large to be transferred uh, via the VPN to other nodes. And then Ting generates ICMP packets back. But if yeah, if the, uh, some host behind the internet uh, uh, does not uh, see these ICMP packets, we'll never adjust the uh, packets that are too large. Now there's another solution, and this is to clamp the MSS field and TCP packets. Uh, which is another mechanism um, which does not use ICMP packets, but just the TCP packets itself. 
Uh, and that will also instruct the other side to uh, reduce the size of the packets. But the uh, limitation here that it's only working for TCP. Now, a few other things we encountered is uh, hosts with frequently changing IP addresses, if you have a cheap ISP, for example. Then you can use uh, dynamic DNS services, for example. Uh, or you could uh, have uh, other nodes on the VPN uh, remember and forward known addresses of other nodes. And that's all already implemented in Ting for some years. Um, there are ISPs that uh, only allow certain types of traffic. For example, they only allow web traffic. Uh, so you have to encapsulate everything into HTTP or HTTPS. And in some cases you can use ICMP if it's not blocked or DNS. Uh, Tink does not implement that, but there are some uh, VPN solutions which do allow it, and there are also lots of utilities around which can encapsulate any uh, TCP stream into ICMP or DNS for you. And then there's a more, uh, yeah, another difficult problem, ISPs that are dropping or delaying small UDP packets. Uh, this is a commercial motivation because voice over IP also looks like small UDP packets, and if they offer telephony services for which you have to pay much more than for your internet uh, connection, then they want to uh, disallow voice over IP and make it difficult for you. The problem is, if you drop packets, then TCP streams inside those, those tunnels think it's because of congestion, and they will reduce their uh, bandwidth. Uh, and for this, it's, uh, it's a really hard problem, and I don't have a solution for this yet. Now, uh, okay, the internet is uh, hostile, but uh, you, that's probably the reason that you want to set up a VPN in the first place. But uh, how do you trust your nodes? Do you have to have some form of authentication and authorization? The authentication is proving who you are, and you can do that by using a passport, for example, in real life. It's a document that shows you, I am, uh, no, I am who's sleeping. Uh, and the nodes on your VPN also should do that. You don't want to allow any node on the VPN. But proving who you are is not the same as saying, okay, you are allowed to use this range of IP addresses on my uh, VPN, or you, have, you are allowed to use this much bandwidth on my VPN. Um, and the problem is that these days, uh, a lot of authorization is actually authentication. For example, uh, you are allowed to access a web server if your client certificate, which is just a way to authenticate you, is in the list. But that does not, uh, that's not a, uh, a method of doing proper cryptographic authorization. But two well-known, uh, and that's mostly authentication methods, are the X509 certificates. It's, uh, you know it from HTTPS connections. Uh, it's a centralized approach, uh, so there's VeriSign at the top and some other companies and via a few middlemen which all want to extort money from you, you can get this uh, certificate. Uh, but it focuses on uh, identities and, uh, and websites because it's made for, for that. So you can only put some information like an LDAP identity, like uh, my organization is called this and I'm from this country into a certificate and may be limited to a certain uh, URL. Open PHP keys, uh, they are, I think they're very nice because they have a decentralized approach, but it also has this limitation. It was meant for email, so it is limited to uh, email addresses. So we want something different. Um, we want something that has some Open PHP features like uh, decentralized uh, workings, uh, uh, a web of trust uh, that you can build up, but we want more. We want to authorize anything, not just email addresses. Uh, we want to um, uh, add and remove uh, authorizations very quickly. We don't want to go through uh, uh, revocation uh, uh, methods. We want to forbid things as well. And we want to make group decisions so that every node, for example in the VPN, uh, has the same way of allowing or disallowing uh, other nodes. So I created a library for this. Uh, it's a lightweight framework to uh, do authorization. You can create many small certificates. Uh, for example, let's say uh, somebody uh, said uh, one of the nodes for VTN, for example, that uh, at a certain time that another node is allowed to access the VPN. 
and newer certifications, so just overall older ones. So you don't have a revocation certificate, no, you have just an updated authorization. And the library makes it very easy to query these uh, stored uh, authorizations. And we do not want just a list of the certificates, no, we just want to know, is this person allowed to uh, go on the VPN? And the library, okay. Anyway, you can find more about the website, and there's a birth of a feather session uh, at 5 o'clock.